Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson. I'm also a technical consultant for Altium. And today we are gonna be talking about different types of ground connections that you might see in component data sheets, also in reference designs and subschematics that you might find online. If you're like me, you appreciate the use of a single ground plane all connected to a single net. However, if you look at some component data sheets, you're gonna see some other ground connections like PGND, AGND, DGND, SGND, and the list goes on and on. So how do you reconcile the need to have a consistent ground potential everywhere with the fact that you have all these different connections on different components? That's what we're gonna look at today. Let's go ahead and get started. When you start looking at some component data sheets for some components like digital to analog converters or analog to digital converters, or maybe some other components that require an analog input, you will usually see some different ground net names or some ground pin names on those pinouts for those components. So some of the common ground names that you will see are DGND, and this is normally standing for a digital ground connection. And then sometimes you will see AGND, which normally stands for an analog ground connection. And sometimes you'll even see something like SGND and PGND. This normally stands for something like signal ground, and then this might usually stand for something like power ground, if you're dealing with a non-isolated switching regulator that has a feedback line. However, this could also mean secondary, this could also mean primary, if you're dealing with an isolated power converter. So if you're dealing with an isolated switching DC-DC converter and it has built-in isolation inside of the regulator package, then the S no longer means signal, it usually means secondary, so the secondary side of the package. P doesn't mean power anymore, it actually means primary primary side of the package. So these are just some of the different ground naming schemes that you will see in your component data sheets depending on the component. These are usually components that have like an analog input or that require a dedicated quiet analog power supply. And they may be components like I just mentioned, like controllers for a DC-DC converter, especially if they are going to be an integrated circuit that has an isolated DC-DC converter block in it. So in a component like a DC-DC converter, these are referring to physically separated grounds, especially if you're dealing with a secondary and primary side DC-DC converter. So essentially what this is saying is that you have to physically separate these two in order ma to maintain galvanic isolation. If you're dealing with a integrated DC-DC converter that is not isolated, these two sides of the system are going to be connected somewhere at a single point. And so we'll go over how to do that in just a moment. If you're dealing with something like a digital to analog converter, analog to digital converter, and then they have these different pins on them, these are referring to two different references in the system that are used for measuring the input signal and then outputting the proper signal level on the digital interface or vice versa if you're dealing with like a DAC. Other components that don't have all this separation are just gonna use a very simple designation for ground, GND, which means the same ground everywhere. There's no splits, there's no separation, no nothing. And I am a firm believer that if you do the layout properly, you section your board properly, and you route things properly, this is all you're gonna need, is just a single ground net. So, how do you reconcile the need for these different pins on all these different components with the need for a single consistent ground potential everywhere in your PCB. And what exactly are the manufacturers of components trying to tell you by creating all of these different pins? Okay, so first let's take a look at something like an ADC. So if you look at an ADC, just as an example here, I've got a block representing my symbol and what you'll usually see is something like, this pin will be digital VDD, analog VDD, and then you'll have an analog ground, and then you will have a digital ground. And then if you actually start reading some data sheets, what you will see is that 
in some digital to analog converter data sheets, they will make a statement saying something to the effect of, you should connect digital ground and analog ground at a single point. So essentially in your schematics, it would look something like this. I might have this symbol here, I might have this symbol here, and then I would take these two nets and then connect them together with a net tie. So you can create net ties in your uh, component libraries if you want. You can give it a nice little uh, piece of copper to represent the connection. Then when you put it into the PCB layout, the design rule engine will apply those design rules to it as you do anything like polygon pours, or you bring any other objects nearby the copper, and then it will make sure things like clearances are maintained and stuff like that. So it's gonna it behave just like any other component in your PCB layout. You just need to make sure that you designate this little thing as a net tie, and then give it a little piece of copper as a footprint. And so we'll go ahead and show an example here shortly. Essentially what they're saying in this case is that any of the digital signals are being referenced to this particular ground net. The analog signal is being re referenced to this ground net. And so when I say referenced, what it means is that the measurement of that digital signal is with respect to this ground. If there was a ground offset between these two nets, then the measurement of a digital signal with respect to this net would yield a different voltage level than the actual signal that might have been sourced with respect to this net. These different grounds represent different references and those correspond to physical regions in the PCB layout, which we then later tie back onto each other with a net tie. So the next thing you have to remember about all of this is that there's actually an analog input. We'll call this analog in. And then there's also going to be some digital input. And this is probably going to be a bunch of stuff in parallel. This could be like an SPI bus. Uh, whatever the case may be. But there's actually going to be a digital in and out, there's gonna be an analog in. If this is an ADC, it's an analog in. If this is a DAC, it's gonna be an analog out, whatever the case may be. But the point is you've got an analog input signal being measured with respect to the analog ground, and then you've got a digital input signal being referenced with respect to the digital ground. If you look on the PCB layout, this actually creates some challenges with layout. And the whole point here between trying to separate, and I use air quotes when I say separate here, but between trying to separate these nets is to try and prevent any of these digital signals that make up this digital interface on this component from injecting noise into the analog input over here. Because remember, the goal in this type of component is to take a very precise measurement of this signal and then convert that to a digital value, which represents a measurement. You wanna make sure that when there's any digital signals coming in and out of this interface, that they are not going to interfere with this analog input. So now let's look at what might happen on the PCB layout. So let's just suppose for a moment, this is my top view of a PCB layout, and I have my chip here, and my analog signal is coming in let's say right here. So this is my analog input, okay? So where do we wanna put the ground in this case and where should we route the digital signals? Well, I'm a firm believer that you shouldn't actually split or physically create a very large separated section of digital ground from analog ground. But if you do it, I'm gonna show you the right way to do it. Now, remember those digital signals are being referenced to the digital ground section. So I'm just gonna kind of draw out a hypothetical region here and we'll call this DGND. So this is my digital ground and we're gonna have everything else underneath this surface layer be analog ground. Now, if you're gonna do this, you need to make sure that those digital signals are only being routed in this region. So maybe they come out here and then they go to another chip that's down here. Let's just say we've got another chip or maybe a connector down here. So you only wanna make sure that if you do this, you have these digital signals only being routed in this region above this digital ground plane. And the whole point here is that you don't wanna have any of these digitals cross this split between these two planes. One of the reasons I always say you just shouldn't split a ground plane period is because there is a tendency for folks to then just route wherever they feel like, and then they end up crossing this split and then they risk creating an EMI problem, and that EMI problem could inject noise into this analog input. 
The reason that they recommend doing this in some of those data sheets is this is a really easy way for most board designers to control noise. And essentially, because you only have return currents being induced in this piece of copper in this region, you won't be able to induce any noise up here in this region. Now, if your chip actually had its pins arranged like this, and you were able to route the signals like this, as I've shown here in two orthogonal directions on the same layer, or possibly with these digital signals on the back layer, guess what? You don't really need to do this if you think about it. You could actually just eliminate this split and have everything be referenced to the same ground. Let's say that you were doing everything on a single layer and you did have these hypothetically separated analog ground and digital grounds. Where should you put your net tie? Well, you should put your net tie somewhere at a single point such that it creates a uniform ground potential across these two planes, meaning you want the V equals zero defined here to be the same V equals zero volts that you define here for this ground region. So you want to put that net tie in a location such that it is not going to allow any return current to pass between the two regions. This right here could be a good spot to do that. So you could put your net tie, let's say, right here, and it's gonna be very close to where these two grounds are located on the chip anyways. So this is a typical recommendation that you might see from the manufacturers, and it's okay to do it if you do it properly. The reason that I recommend not doing it is because a lot of people don't do it properly. So if you are going to do it, make sure you do it properly. One of the use cases for actually doing this is if this is already gonna be a very low frequency signal. If this is a low frequency signal, its return path is not very well defined. It exists in a very large region in this analog section of the ground plane. And so in those cases, it's actually preferable to have this kind of split as long as you do the digital routing correctly, which is only over this DGND region. If you're dealing with an alternative case where say, this isn't a low frequency analog signal, but let's say it's a very high frequency analog signal, like maybe part of a radio. At that point, you're operating in gigahertz. And if you're in the gigahertz range, the return path for this signal is actually very well defined. It follows very close to this analog input trace. So in that case, I would argue that you actually don't need to do any of this splitting. You just need to make sure that you lay out and route things properly so that you don't get crosstalk between the digital interface and then the analog interface. So now what about something like a power converter? I think it actually helps to look at a data sheet for a power converter to really see what they're doing inside of like an isolated DC-DC converter module. And then we can see how to actually connect that onto the PCB with a net tie. Okay, so what I have here is a DC-DC converter that um, I've pulled up off of Octopart. And this is just a Texas Instruments part. If you uh, scroll down here, you can see just from looking at this example application circuit that they have an isolation barrier built into this particular component. So here, GNDP, that's your primary ground, and then GNDS, that's your secondary ground or your output ground. And so you can see here there's inputs, capacitance on the input side, and then of course you got output capacitance on the output side. Now, in this case, you actually don't want to connect the two together with a net tie you would actually connect these two nets together with something like a safety capacitor that has very high capacitance. And the reason you do that is to allow any noise that's on the output side to flow back to the primary ground on the input side. And it can do that by moving directly through that capacitor. That capacitor will also ensure that you continue to have this isolation uh, across this barrier. Okay, so now let's take a look at a buck converter. So here we've got a switching regulator, also from Texas Instruments. Here's the part number. And if you take a look at this pinout for this component, you will actually see that there are also two different ground connections. So PGND and then just a simple GND. So PGND in this case is the path that carries the high pulsed currents around this converter. So PGND needs to be very carefully guided in the layout and then connected back to GND somewhere. Where exactly should you make that connection? Well, you're gonna make that connection with a net tie. You can make that connection in the PCB layout a little bit away from some of these other lines. So let's look at where to do that. 
So now let's just look at this example with our buck converter integrated circuit. So in our buck converter, now we have something a little bit different, right? We have a chip here, it had an exposed ground pad. So this ground pad on the package, we tie to GND, that's the actual ground connection. And then somewhere coming off of the package is our PGND connection. So let's just say it's right here, okay? So this is P. GND. So how do we make the connection between these two? Should we just, you know, throw this here and then maybe put our net tie here and then pour ground everywhere? You could actually do that if you didn't have any other components that need to connect to this net. Unfortunately, you normally do have other components that you need to connect to that net. So there's going to be like an output capacitor, there could be a feedback network, there could be the inductor uh, somewhere that then connects to maybe a snubber circuit, and that snubber could then connect back to PGND, and all of that stuff then needs to connect back to ground. In that case, what you would want to do is you'd have this connected in parallel to all of your output circuitry. It's usually just, a, in the simplest case, it's just gonna be a capacitor. And then this can come off, go through a ground, and then on the back layer is where you can make that connection back to the rest of this ground. So on the back layer, let's suppose we have some grounded copper pour, and then when we come through this via on the back layer, we can then draw a small trace, and then we can put our net tie. And as soon as we put our net tie, What's gonna happen is the polygon pour engine in your design tools is going to apply clearances right here around this section. And it's gonna ensure that any current that needs to come through this via only goes down through this via, goes through this trace, and then disperses back into the ground pour everywhere else. So you're gonna have some clearance that gets applied here on the back side of the PCB. So that's one way to do it. And the point here is that you make the connection very deliberately using this net tie, either on the top or bottom layer. So here I'm showing it on the bottom layer. You could just as well do this on the top layer if you've got all this ground pour on the top layer. So that's what all these different ground connections mean. And at some point you do need to connect them together to ensure that you have a consistent ground everywhere in the system. There are different ways to do it for different types of components, but this video runs over some of the common ways to do it for common components that are going to have these different ground connections built into the package. So grounding can be a complicated subject, especially when you hear guidelines from me saying that you need to have a uniform ground everywhere, and then you have to try and reconcile that with data that you see in a data sheet, which actually shows different ground pins with different net names on them. So if you have any questions about this, I invite anyone watching this to please put your comments and questions in the comment section. And I'm always interested to hear how people make these connections in their systems and what the justification is. So we'd love to hear from you. Make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, go ahead and leave those comments and questions. We'll be sure to address some of those questions in upcoming Q&A videos, so make sure to drop us a line. All right, thanks everybody for watching, and definitely on this stuff, don't forget to call your fabricator.